We are in chapter 11 now, which is looking at the divisions of the nervous system. So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are the primary divisions that we'll be looking at. And we'll start by looking at the central nervous system and talking about the protective uh, features that help to prevent any damage occurring to the brain. So the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. We've talked about that already. And, um, but despite what you saw in the, in the uh, sheep brain dissections, though, the brain is a very delicate, um, soft tissue. It's not as firm as what we saw. The, the sheep brains that we looked at had already been uh, run through a process that that fixes them and makes them tougher, um, that changes the proteins primarily. And so because of that, uh, there's a lot of you know, support in the brain. But in a living brain, it is a very delicate, very, um, very sensitive organ that must be protected from even the slightest pressures. So uh, the protection is pretty significant around the, around the brain and around the spinal cord. Um, it's composed of lots of bones, the two parietal bones, the occipital bone there at the posterior, the temporal bone, uh, bones that are fused together oops, at the anterior of the skull. Um, I'm sorry, the, at, <laughs> at the lateral sides of the skull, the frontal bone, the sphenoid, the ethnoid, and, and then down around the spinal cord, the vertebra are all um, part of the protection for the spinal cord. But that's not the only protection that's provided. The meninges, these are layers of connective tissue, and the cerebrospinal fluid that's captured between the layers um, does a lot to, um, to also protect and shield the brain and spinal cord from being jostled and bumped around. And then finally, for chemical and biological protection, we have the blood-brain barrier that is there. And uh, the blood-brain barrier we've already talked about, um, but it's there to protect the brain from any harmful substances. And it's formed by the astrocytes reaching out and covering over the caps, the gaps between the capillary cells so that in order for any fluids to leave the blood, then um, they have to pass first through either the endothelial cells that um, make up the capillary wall or through the astrocyte themselves. Okay, so let's, you know, we've already talked a lot about the skeletal system. You've already heard a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. Let's focus instead now on the meningeal layers, the meninges. So a single layer, and there are three of them, is called a menix. So together and pluralized, they are the meninges. And there are three layers of connective tissue membranes that are found external to the central nervous system organs, the brain and the spinal cord. The most superficial layer is referred to as the dura mater. Dura, like dura bull, means tough. And mater means mother, so this is the tough mother. And hopefully you got a chance to see the dura mater and to experience just how very thick and um, strong this layer of connective tissue is. Deep to the dura mater is the arachnoid mater, arachnoid because of spider, and, and this is a real webby kind of gauzy layer, so there's not a lot of substance here, and we weren't able to see it in the preserved specimens that we were looking at today in lab. And then last of all, the, the layer that is actually the first layer surrounding the brain and the spinal cord, so it adheres to the brain and the spinal cord, and you can't really pull it away at all, is the pia mater. Pia, like piano in uh, music, means um, soft. And so the pia mater is the softest, apparently, of the three, dura, the three meningeal layers. So what is their function? Well, they cover and they help to protect the central nervous system. They provide a pathway for, and <laughs> that's interesting, provide a pathway for the blood vessels that supply the central nervous system organs. So, oh, interesting. The blood vessels. 
that are there supplying the organs of the, you know, the brain and the spinal cord with nutrients and with oxygen. They enclose the cerebrospinal fluid, so they form almost like a little bubble wrap. So the, the, between the cerebrospinal fluid and the, the layers, uh, you know, because the, the cerebrospinal fluid is captured there, it perform, or, or it forms like an insulating, uh, insulating from bumps and jostling uh, layer there. And then last of all, they form kind of partitions within the skull. So the, and you can see here in this picture that here's the dura mater that is folded down in between, and what we're looking at here is in between the right and left cerebral hemispheres. And so it helps to kind of separate them and then to kind of hold them in place. Um, I've heard a, a, of a description, you know, suggesting that they act a little like seatbelts, kind of strapping in each of the different zones of the brain and, and adhering it back or, or, or connecting it back to the skull itself. The dura mater, as I said, is the outermost and, and the thickest of the three layers, and it's composed of a dense, irregular connective tissue. So it's dense, meaning that it's built primarily of protein fibers, collagenous fibers especially. Um, it's irregular because the protein fibers are just laid down every which way. There's not an organized direction, and so you can tug at it from any direction and it is strong regardless. Um, and sorry about that. And there are two layers to it. The endosteal layer is the one that is most superficial. Um, it's actually attached, adheres to the inner surface of the bones. So there is the endosteal layer of the um, dura mater. then um, we don't see that endosteal layer. So endost, remember, means uh, bone. Endo is inside the bone. We don't see this endosteal layer around the spinal cord. And then there is the meningeal layer. And this is the inner layer. And it's, it's the, the outermost covering then of the brain and the spinal cord. So if you take away the skull, then you lose the endosteal layer, but you're left with the meningeal layer. And so when we saw the dura mater in, our, in lab today, it was the meningeal layer of the dura mater. And um, it's also known when it's there around the spinal cord as the spinal dural sheath. So, the epidural space, and you probably have heard of that term before because we talk about giving a woman who's going into labor an epidural, that's the cavity that's between the bone and the dural sheath. And the, or, you know, the, so it's the cavity between the, that's, that spinal dural sheath, it's, so it's only found in the spine, and the vertebra. And so it's external to the dural sheath and internal to the, um, to the bone of the vertebra. And it's filled with adipose and areolar tissue and blood vessels. And so anesthetic is introduced into this epidural space to provide that epidural um, nerve blocking agent and to, to cause or to block the sensory and the motor functions then of the pelvic region. So it's administered lower in the back so that it only affects those nerves that are, uh, at, that are feeding into the, the legs and the pelvis and below. So the meningeal layer, as we said, extend deep into the, well, okay, so and just if you're looking to see where this epidural space is, it would be right out here. So the dura mater is the blue, so it would be out there just on the other side of the blue layer. So back up in the uh, brain, the, the dura mater folds and dives deep between here, we see it between the left and right cerebral hemispheres. That's the falx cerebri, 
or cerebri between the cerebellar hemispheres there's the fox cerebelli and then between the cerebrum and the cerebellum is the tentorium cerebelli so we got three layers or, or three regions where septa are formed by a, a fold of the dura mater and, um, and it separates these two um, regions from each other so these are again sort of like those seat belts that that are reaching into the brain and kind of holding it in place inside the skull then last of all up along the um, mid sagittal line at the top at the very most superior portion of the skull are the dural sinuses and here at the dural sinuses two layers of the dura mater are separated from each other and they enclose this space called the dural sinus and so this is where the venous blood that is draining from the brain collects and then is emptied down into the internal jugular veins there at the neck region and we also have in that zone um, these processes or these regions where the arachnoid mater kind of extends up into the dural sinus and so cerebrospinal fluid as it is flowing up and around the brain here in this subdural space or the that um, you know where the cerebrospinal fluid flows these arachnoid granulations are busy taking cerebrospinal fluid and reabsorbing it back into the blood so we haven't seen yet where cerebral well we've talked about where cerebrospinal fluid is made in the ventricles of the brain here's where it gets taken back up again so that we don't wind up pressurizing that um, that subdural space where the cerebrospinal fluid flows and that way then you know the cerebrospinal fluid goes back into the blood which is where it came from um, there at the arachnoid villi in the in the um, in the ventricles okay so the arachnoid layer that's that middle layer of the meninges with a that's composed of a thin really webby looking membrane of collagenous fibers and some elastic fibers in there too and it adheres to the inner lining or the inner layer of the dura mater is where you know it's kind of where we see it with these fibers that extend through the subdural space so we have this narrow serous cavity that separates the arachnoid and the dura maters the subdural space and it's filled with uh, uh, an interstitial fluid cerebrospinal fluid and the arachnoid granulations also known as the arachnoid villi um, are where the arachnoid mater as i was saying before i got it to this a little bit earlier protrudes up into those into the dural sinus and that's where we absorb and empty the central uh the cerebrospinal fluid back into the venous circulation oh i got confused it's at the subarachnoid space that the cerebrospinal fluid flows i apologize so um here below the uh, arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space and that's where the cerebrospinal fluid is flowing i apologize okay so um the arachnoid mater now one last mater to go and that's the pia mater it's the innermost layer and it's a very delicate transparent connective tissue um, you could see it kind of covering over the the um, gyri the the ridges of the the cerebrum or the cerebral cortex and the the uh, sulci the valleys between those ridges when we were doing our uh, brain dissection and it follows those folds very closely in, at both the brain and the spinal cord and it's really richly vascularized you can see all the blood vessels that were found 
in that area. So this piometer serves as a pathway that the blood vessels can grow through in order to uh, supply the brain with uh, the blood required deeper in the brain tissues. And uh, last of all, some medical issues related to the meninges are uh, meningitis, which is an inflammation of the meninges, and it frequently uh, follows uh, respiratory throat or ear infections. And usually it's caused by a bacterial or maybe a viral infection. So there's bacterial meningitis and viral meningitis both. And uh, one of the, the issues associated with meningitis is that it may disrupt the normal blood flow in the brain as well as um, the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid and it's very serious because it's possible that the infection that is causing inflammation in the meninges can spread to the tissues of the brain or the spinal cord which is very dangerous indeed and then the other um, medical issue that is associated with the brain is encephalitis which is inflammation of actual brain tissue rather than just the meninges so encephalitis and meningitis both of them are inflammation that itis ending itis that is always means inflammation of you know whatever is being referenced here in the first part so enceph and kephalon that refers to the brain itself And I'll let you laugh at that if you wish. If you don't wish, then just carry right on. <laughs> okay, so the ventricles of the brain. These are a series of four hollow chambers, and they're lined with, um, with ependymal cells. Remember, ependymal cells are one of the, the cerebrospinal fluid neuroglial cells. And um, these ependymal cells are responsible for... Uh, drawing fluid from the blood and using it to form cerebral spinal fluid. And there are four of these hollow chambers associated with the brain. In, let's see, so we're looking here anteriorly. So here is left, this is right. No, I'm sorry. This is, this is right. There we are, I finally got it correct. So here's the right side, here's the left side. On the right side is first ventricle, left side is the second ventricle, then the third ventricle is found right here, just inferior to the corpus callosum of the brain, and it's a small little package there of cerebral spinal fluid. That's the third ventricle. And then here, if we're looking from the side, is the fourth ventricle right here in between the cerebrum and the um, medulla oblong, I'm sorry, between the cerebellum, here's the cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata there at the very top of the spinal cord. So four ventricles, and that one is number four, is the fourth, and um, there, this sets up a circulation pattern. So cerebrospinal fluid is formed in the first, second, and third ventricles. That's where we find those ependymal cells that are busy pulling fluid from the blood. And the fluid then flows from the first and second ventricle into the third ventricle, and then down what is referred to as the cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct, which, you know, in Roman times, an aqueduct was a series of, of channels that brought water from down out of the mountains during the summertime to Rome to, to give water to the population there. Um, and then it travels from the fourth ventricle directly into the central canal of the spinal cord. And then, so the cerebrospinal fluid then flows right down the center of the spinal cord. And then when it reaches the end, it turns and now flows up through the subarachnoid space. And so it's there in the subarachnoid space that it flows back up the spinal cord and around the brain again in the subarachnoid space. So it flows up and then around, and it's there at the top of the brain that the fluid gets drawn back into 
the, the uh, dural sinuses, or at the dural sinuses, it gets drawn back into the blood. There we are. Okay, so those are the ventricles of the brain. What is the cerebrospinal fluid that the, the brain uh, is producing? Oh, shoot. I have a little bit more to say about them. I'm sorry. I forgot that uh, I had this slide coming too. So the lateral ventricles, the first and the second ventricles, are paired. They have kind of a, they look like, to me, they look a little bit like a ram's horn or, um, or a C shape. And they are located deep in side in the interior of the left and right cerebral hemispheres and hopefully you're able to see them once you uh, did those slices into the brain where you were slicing in this way um, and they are separated from each other here at the um, third ventricle by uh, what's called the, the septum pellucidum which is a really thin transparent little membrane um, the third ventricle is a very narrow chamber inside that's part of the diencephalon and it connects with these lateral ventricles here by these interventricular the interventricular foramen cerebrospinal fluid itself it's a very thin, clear, watery fluid with a composition similar to blood plasma, but it has less protein in it. The plasma proteins, we'll talk about this when we get to the blood, but there are lots of proteins in blood plasma. Those plasma proteins aren't allowed out of the capillaries. And so when we make cerebrospinal fluid, it is depleted of protein compared to uh, blood plasma. Um, and it's depleted in glucose, calcium, and potassium as well. On the other hand, it's enriched in vitamin C and sodium and the chloride ion and in magnesium ion. So the functions then of the cerebrospinal fluid is to help cushion the brain. I think of it as like the air and bubble wrap. If the meningeal layers are uh, the bubble wrap, then the cerebrospinal fluid fills those layers and uh, protects, buffers the, the movements of the brain, of the brain, of the skull, so that they don't impact the brain. It also has nutrients in it that help to nourish the brain, and it helps to spread hormones throughout the um, brain and the spinal cord. So lots of functions associated with cerebrospinal fluid. The choroid plexuses, also known as the choroid, granulations are where we see the, um, the cerebrospinal fluid being made and they're found in the walls of the first and second ventricles and also even though I don't say it they're also in the third ventricle and they're covered these these choroid plexuses are these capillary networks that form a little knot in the wall of the ventricles and then they get covered over by ependymal cells. These are ciliated cells, and they're continuous with the lining of the ventricles. So we have blood vessel here. There's the lumen of the blood vessel. And then notice it's got these ependymal cells that completely surround the blood vessel. So here's another blood vessel, again, surrounded by ependymal cells. And um, the ependymal cells form tight junctions, so that prevents the easy movement of water-soluble materials and and across, you know, out of the, you know, here we have materials trying to diffuse out of the capillaries, but when they come up against the tight junctions that are among those append between the ependymal cells then it's a barrier that doesn't let any of those water-soluble materials diffuse past the ependymal cells. And so the, the ependymal cells role then is to select the materials that should be placed into the cerebrospinal fluid and prevent anything else from entering cerebrospinal fluid. And then the cilia there uh, that are on the surface of the ependymal cells, um, they will beat and help to encourage cerebrospinal fluid 
to move from um, one ventricle to the next and then down the, um, down the central canal of the spinal cord. Okay, so the last thing that I talk about here are some medical issues associated with cerebral spinal fluid and the biggie is what's referred to as hydrocephalus. Um, hydro meaning water, of course. Ceph means head. So it's water on the head, if you can go with that. Um, it is the abnormal accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid around the brain, and it can result from a blockage somewhere in the flow of cerebral spinal fluid because we keep making cerebral spinal fluid, but if there's a blockage, then the cerebral spinal fluid is slowed or not even allowed to go past that blockage. So in infants, because the skull bones haven't fully fused yet, it can result in this um, crazy enlargement and, and uh, you know, real distortion of the shape of the skull. In adults, because the skull is rigid and won't spread apart, those joints have formed fully and the, the, the skull bones can't press apart from each other then because the skull is rigid what happens instead of the the head swelling in size the brain just gets squeezed by the accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid and as blood vessels get compressed and blood flow is discouraged into areas then that can lead to um, significant brain damage um, because of all that extra fluid so what's the treatment? Well, you use something called a shunt. It's like a, vein, a drainage tube here, and you can see just under the skull of this little girl's um, scalp, I'm sorry, just under the scalp of that little girl is one of these shunts, and it drains uh, cerebral spinal fluid down through the tubing that's been implanted and delivers it to um, one of the neck veins so that that venous flow will carry away the extra cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so there it is. Everything you wanted to know about the meninges and the cerebrospinal fluid that flows between them, but we're afraid to ask. If you have any questions beyond this, give me a call, send me a text, uh, send me an email. All right, bye-bye.